I'm going to tell you about uh, the relationship between microscopic physics and macroscopic, macroscopic physics. And uh, more um, specifically, I would like to um, show you that um, if, if you, you know that uh, one of the tasks and one of the goals of Cold Atom these days is to uh, achieve the quantum simulation program where we try to solve very difficult mathematical problems using exponential systems. And the thing in, in that kind of uh, situation is that when you want to tr process your data to extract some physical and meaningful information from an experiment, you cannot rely anymore on some specific model because you're working in a regime where model and mathematics and theory doesn't work anymore. So you're kind of in free space uh, and you try to find some uh, reliable quantitative information from your experiments. Uh, I would like to illustrate that on a very simple problem, which is the thermometry of a cold atom system. So how do you measure the temperature in a cold atom system? So if you are dealing with a weakly interacting or ideal gas, it's kind of straightforward. You know that you can just perform a time of flight expansion, which is that you take your system, turn off the trap, let the cloud expand. If you have very weak or absolutely no interactions, you know that the momentum and the, or the velocity of the atoms will stay constant during the expansion. And so after a given time of flight, you know that the density profile of your system will just be a copy, rescale copy, of the momentum distribution in the trap. And whether you're dealing with Boltzmann particles, with fermions, with bosons, we know that the wings of the momentum distribution will just be given by Gaussian law, exponential minus p squared divided by 2 and kbt. And so by making a Gaussian fit of the wings of the distribution, you have access to the temperature. Now the situation is completely different if you're dealing with a strongly correlated or strongly interacting system. Because in this case, first during the expansion, you have interactions, you have collisions between the atoms. And so the momentum distributions, the uh, velocity of individual atoms is not constant during the, uh, during the expansion. And so the, what you get after time of flight is not any more a rescale copy of the momentum distribution in the trap. Okay, you could say, but it's very easy to solve this problem. I just have to turn off interactions during the expansion. I have flashback resonances. I move the uh, magnetic field to some value where A is, is zero or very small. And so I have some free flight expansion during, uh, during the time of flight. Okay, I get a copy, a rescale copy of the momentum distribution after my, uh, my time of flight. But how do, we ex do I extract a temperature from this momentum distribution? Because I'm dealing now with a strongly correlated system, and a priori, if it's strongly correlated, uh, we don't have any reliable theory to describe that, except uh, very advanced Monte Carlo, which until now have been successful only for unitary systems. And if you want to extract the temperature, you need to rely on some approximate model, which by definition is only partially reliable. And so the determination of the temperature is only partially reliable. And so what I would like to discuss uh, today is to review some exact results uh, which can be arrived from very general result, from very general principles. So for instance, the fact that we're dealing with short range interactions, universality, um, and the energy conservation, these kind of things to uh, provide experimentalists some reliable ways of analyzing quantitatively their experiments. So there are going to be two parts in my, uh, in my talk. And the first part will be dedicated to the analysis of the momentum distribution, just like I said in my introduction. And I'll be discussing uh, one physical quantity which was introduced for the first, part, first time by Shinatan in this paper, which is called the contact parameters which describes the properties of the tails of the momentum distribution for an interacting system. And I will show you that it does not give the temperature directly, unlike what you have for an ideal gas. But nevertheless, we can relate this tail to lots of different physical quantities, which are a priori completely unrelated to the momentum distribution. So if you want to have a very comprehensive review of these issues of uh, contact parameters, you can also uh, look at these two papers by Ivan Castin and Felix Werner that was published uh, that were published in PRA. So the starting point of uh, Shinatan's approach is to note something that we have uh, have already heard 
in uh, Dorter's talk, uh, which is the fact that the Dirac potential, uh, so some coupling constant times delta, is singular. Which means that, uh, in other words, when you take some realistic potential, so some van der Waals plus hardcore, for instance, and you take the range of this potential to zero, if you don't work carefully, everything will blow up. You have all kinds of physical quantities that will uh, appear, and uh, you don't get any uh, meaningful results in this case. So you cannot simply replace, when you take the range of potential uh, to zero, your potential by a Dirac potential. So I would like to illustrate that uh, on a very simple calculation, which is something that has been discussed several times today, which is a bound state of a, uh, of a, of a cold atoms, a pair of cold atoms. So I would like to solve the uh, Schrodinger equation for the two-body problem and find the bound state for this kind of potential here. So I just have to solve this equation, minus h bar square divided by two mu times the Laplacian of the wave function plus the potential gb delta of r times the wave function is equal to i e psi of r. And so I would like to look, I, I want to look at bound states, so for which the energy is negative here. So since I have a contact potential here, delta of r, the only uh, value that matters for psi is uh, psi at zero. And so I can replace that by psi of zero. And so I'm gonna solve this equation in momentum space. So I'm gonna expand the wave function over a basis of um, plane waves. So I write that psi of r is equal to the sum over all momenta of some amplitude psi tilde of k times exponential i q of r divided by square root of v, where v is some quantization volume. And I have the reciprocal relation, which is that psi tilde C tilde of k is equal to the integral over the whole space of psi of r times exponential minus i k r divided by square root of v. By the way, if I apply this transformation, this Fourier transformation to the Dirac potential, I obtain that delta tilde of k is equal to just one over square root of v. So I represent the Schrodinger equation in momentum space. So I get that h bar square k square divided by two times mu times c tilde of k plus, so gb divided by square root of v times the value of the wave function in zero, so it's just sum over k of one over square root of v c tilde of k is equal to e times C tilde of k. But by the way, mu here is the reduced mass. And in the rest of the talk, I will consider only identical particles. So I will take mu is equal to m divided by 2. So let's take s is equal to 1 over v sum over k of C tilde of k. So what I get is simply that C tilde of k times e minus h bar square k square divided by 2 mu is equal to gb times s. And so C tilde of k is equal to gb times s divided by e minus, so I'm going to write 2 times epsilon of k where epsilon of k is equal to h bar square k square divided by 2m. And so I have some kind of self-consistent equation because s depends on c tilde of k and c tilde of k depends on s. So I just re-express, uh, insert in the expression of s the expression of c tilde of k that I found. And what I have is that s is equal to gb times v times the sum over k of s divided by e minus 2 epsilon k. I can simplify by s. And I get finally one equation for uh, e, which is that 1 over gb is equal to 1 over v 
times the sum over k of e divided by of sum over k of one mi of one divided by e minus two epsilon of k. So this is a well-defined equation for this quantity he, here, which is e, the energy that I found, that I that I'm looking for. Okay, but here you see immediately that you have a problem because here I'm doing a sum over all momenta, so I'm uh, making an integral over the whole space. So if I go to the continuous limit, actually this sum here is an integral over all space that scale like the integral of k square dk if I integrate in spherical coordinates. Epsilon of k here scales like k square 2. And so I see that actually this integral is k square divided by k square times dk is the integral of dk, which is an infinite quantity. And so actually this equation here is just meaningless because the right hand side is just uh, infinite. So the reason for that is that uh, in reality, of course, there is some, um, some finite range to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the potential. So actually the delta potential is not a real thing. And so uh, to describe this uh, finite range, I will just introduce a cutoff in momentum space. So I will say that k must be smaller than some lambda, and lambda minus one is just the range of the potential. So now everything is finite, everything is nice. But I have another problem, which is now that the solution of my equation will depend explicitly on lambda. So what I'm gonna do, some, something which is a bit wild at this stage, but is that I will try to make this converge when lambda goes to zero, or goes to infinity. And the way to do that is just to add a kind of term on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equation. So I'm just going to add 1 divided by 2 epsilon k here. And so I'm going to add here So now if you look carefully at this term here and that you expand, so the leading order term will vanish because I've chosen the counter term here to compensate exactly the, uh, the leading order of the initial fraction here. And so this is gonna scale like one over k to the fourth. When I multiply by k square, I'm gonna have something that scale like one over k to the square. And so that's gonna converge when lambda goes to infinity. So I can now safely remove this lambda here, this will converge at the zero range limit. And so, so now this is physically meaningful. I don't have any uh, occurrence of the range of the potential. E is just some energy of the bound state, so it's something which, is, uh, which has a physical meaning. And so this, is, this has a physical meaning. And so now this quantity here must also have a physical meaning. And so I'm going to call that 1 over g. And that's going to be the uh, physical coupling constant for, for your system. So I will not finish the, the calculation because it's really uh, easy to, uh, to, to, to finish, to complete. But if you write that g is equal to 4 pi h bar square a divided by m, you get that indeed you have a bound state only if A is positive, and in this case, the binding energy E is equal to minus H bar square divided by 2 MA square. So everything works fine if I replace the bare complete constant, 1 over GB, by this 1 over G here. So I've summarized this result here. You recover all the usual results if you assume that the coupling constant GB depends on the range of the potential. And it depends on, uh, on the range of the potential using this method, this law here. 1 over GB of lambda is equal to 1 over G minus 1 over V times this kind of term. What does it mean physically? It means that you see that when lambda goes to infinity, this term dominates compared to 1 over G, which is just a physical quantity, which is finite, which doesn't depend on the cutoff. So it means that when lambda is very large, uh, 1 over GB is negative and large. So it means that GB is small and negative. 
So it means that you are dealing actually with some attractive potential. We knew that already. We knew that we have some Venevar's tail, which is uh, very small, vanishingly small, which is normal because what I said that when you take the range of the potential to zero, or if you take lambda to infinity, the system diverges. So you need to compensate that by reducing the coupling constant. So using this scheme here. And so, at least in the case of the two-body problem, if you apply this kind of recipe, which is inspired from renormalization techniques, you get something which is completely finite and works fine. And the assumption that we are going to make is uh, some universality hypothesis, which is to say that this recipe here works also in the case of a many-body problem. So what I mean by that, if I uh, take the limit of short-range interactions or zero-range interactions and I use the same renormalization of the complete constant, then all physical quantities will remain finite. Okay, when I say all physical quantities, it's not completely true. There are some physical quantities that may diverge, and it also occurs, happens in the case of the, uh, the uh, two-body problem, because if you look at the two-body problem, for instance, if you look at the kinetic energy of the system, you will see that in the zero-range limit, the kinetic energy is infinitely large. And the potential energy between the two atoms is also infinitely large, but negative. And what you can show is that uh, the sum of this plus infinity minus infinity gives you the finite, finite binding energy E equal minus h bar square divided by 2m squared. So usually uh, we justify this universality hypothesis by saying uh, that we are dealing with cold atoms where the uh, wavelength of the atoms is very large compared to the size of the potential. And so that's why we can neglect all the details and we can reduce everything to uh, this uh, coupling constant or the scattering length. But to be honest, it's not so obvious first, and it doesn't always work. We have strong evidence that it works with fermions, but we know, for instance, that for bosons, it's only partially true. We know that for bosons, it is been, it's been discussed uh, earlier today, we know that for mean field uh, approximation, it's okay. Uh, everything depends only on the scattering length, but if you go beyond the mean field approximation, we know that we must introduce, at some point, three-body interactions and the three-body parameters that have been discussed by, uh, by Rudy and, and Dorte. So this is not an obvious and trivial hypothesis. This is really an hypothesis that sometimes works and sometimes does not work. But in our case, we're going to assume that it's working. So now I'm going to show you that um, if we apply this kind of recipe to uh, a many-body many -body system, we can have access to some information about the momentum distribution. And as I said, it's going to be different from a Boltzmann distribution. What, we're, what I'm going to show you that actually the momentum distribution at large momenta scales like one over the fourth power of the momentum with some constants. So the factor of two is not really important here. Uh, C, which is called the, uh, the contact density or the contact parameter. I start with a many body Hamiltonian. So H is equal to some kinetic energy term. So there's a sum of our space, the sum of the spins of psi dagger sigma of R times the kinetic energy operator. And plus some interaction energy. So which is for my delta potential, the complete constant. So it's a running complete constant that will depend on some cutoff times psi up, psi down, dagger, psi down, psi up. Yeah, so I'm dealing with spin one half fermions. And so I would like to know the free energy of the system. So F is the free energy of my ensemble. So of course, it's a uh, very difficult problem to address uh, because we don't know, we don't even know what is the ground state uh, analytically of this, uh, of this Hamiltonian. But as uh, you will see, 
we ha can have information about the derivative of the uh, free energy with respect to the coupling constant. Because we have a theorem, which is Hellman's Feynman theorem, that tells you that if you take the derivative of the free energy with respect to some parameter, any parameter, is just the mean value of the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to this parameter. So in general, in general, it's expressed in terms of the derivative of the energy, so the free energy at zero temperature, but it, was, it works also at finite temperature if you consider the free energy of the system. So if I look at the derivative of the free energy with respect to the bare coupling constant, well, I just look at my Hamiltonian and I see that the bare coupling constant is only here. So it's just the mean value of the integral over all space of this quantity here. So psi up dagger, psi down dagger, psi down, psi up. And so I can re-express that as the mean value of the energy minus the kinetic energy, so T is going to be the kinetic energy, divided by GB. So I'm almost done, so I just multiply the right-hand side and left-hand side by GB. So it's going to be the, so the energy of the system minus the mean value of the kinetic energy here. And so if you remember, in my renormalization scheme, what was important is was 1 over GB. So I will just multiply here the top and the bottom by GB. So I have GB squared divided by DGB, which is the di dif differential of, of 1 over GB. So this is just minus 1 over GB times DF divided by D of 1 GB. Okay, and I'm now done. So I know that 1 over GB and 1 over G depends, uh, differ just by this quantity here, which is just a constant with respect to the uh, bare coupling constant. So D of 1 over GB is just D over 1 over G. So I can remove the B here and to replace it by the real coupling constant. And I can just replace 1 over GB by the uh, real uh, coupling constants, uh, what I have is 1 over G minus 1 over V sum over K of 1 divided by 2 epsilon K is equal to E minus 1 minus what? The kinetic energy, so it's a sum over K of the number of particles in state K times the kinetic energy of state K. And there is a DF D over G. So I have two physical quantities. I have 1 over G dF divided by D1 over G. So this is physical by, by my uh, universality hypothesis. The energy is also some physical quantity. So I'm going to put them on, let's say, the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, I'm going to put what's not a priori converging. So there is uh, the sum over k of nk epsilon k plus 1 over 2 epsilon k 1 over v df divided by d 1 over g. So this is series. I don't know whether it converges or not. This is finite. 
So if the right-hand side is finite, it means that this series must converge. So it means that the argument of the series must be going to zero when the momentum goes to zero. So this must go to zero when k goes to infinity, right? Sorry. And so what I simply get in this case, that n of k must scale like minus 1 divided by 2 epsilon k square, 1 over v, df divided by d1 over g. So I remind you that epsilon k scales like k square. So epsilon k square scale, scales like k to the fourth power. So I have my first result. So indeed, the momentum distribution scales like 1 over k to the four. But I have something more, which is that the prefactor here, the contact density, whatever uh, this factor here, the, the, the factor two here is just so that the momentum distribution per spin state is C divided by k to the four. Here we have the total momentum distribution. That's the uh, reason of this factor of two here. Anyway, so we have a second thing, which is that we know the prefactor. So if, if I replace, uh, express uh, one over g by, uh, with the uh, scattering length and epsilon k with the h bar and the m and everything, what I see that the contact density here, c, is just minus four pi m divided by h bar squared df divided by d one over eight times e here. So you see that the momentum distribution is not directly related to temperature, but it's related to some thermodynamical quantity, so some macroscopic quantity, which is a free energy or the derivative of the free energy with respect to the scattering length or the inverse of the scattering length. But you see that just by this very simple analysis, which is based on the fact that we want to have some finite physical results, even though the Dirac potential is highly singular, leads us to a first result about the momentum distribution and the relationship of the momentum distribution with the um, um, with the uh, thermodynamic properties of the uh, of the system. Okay, so I would like to illustrate that very briefly on some very simple examples. So I um, I made the demonstration for spin one half fermions because that's going to be the main topic of my talk. But it works also for bosons in some certain limits. And actually, you can. Uh, use this kind of argument to demonstrate the existence of quantum depletion in a gas of bosons. So if I consider a gas of bosons, they've been discussed uh, earlier today, uh, we know that in the mean field approximation, the chemical potential of a gas of bosons is just the coupling constant G times the density M. And so at zero temperature, the free energy is just the energy. Uh, you just have to integrate the chemical potential with respect to the atom number. And the energy of the system is g times n squared divided by 2v. Well, I can apply the previous results to say that the momentum distribution of my Bose Einstein condensate will have a 1 over k to the 4 tail with a prefactor that's going to be simply the derivative of e with respect to 1 over a. And so you have some quantum depletion. It tells you directly that you must have some, some quantum depletion, meaning that you have atoms which are not in the ground state k equal to zero. You have atoms at large k. And so you have some information about the uh, tail of the momentum distribution. And what is nice is that you may know about the uh, Bogolubov approach to uh, both anti condensates. That gives you some prediction for the, um, for the momentum distribution and the quantum depletion. If you introduce the UK and VK parameters of the Bogolubov uh, transformation, you know, you can show that in the ground state, in the bose einstein condensate, n of k, is just a mean value of vk square. It's actually vk square. And it's, if you make the whole Bogolubov analysis, it's just I, h pi n square a square divided by k to the fourth. And actually, this number here is exactly the same thing that you obtain if you just take the derivative of the energy with respect to 1 over a. So this approach allows you to recover directly uh, this result of the Bogolubov uh, approach. I'm telling you about this result because it's been tested recently 
So in this paper that was published last year in 2016 by the group of um, uh, David Clement at Institute Optic, where they measured the momentum distribution of a gas of bosons. So it was, in their case, uh, helium atoms. You probably know that helium atoms can be put in a metastable state, so it's an excited state which has a very, very long radiative lifetime, so several thousands of seconds. And uh, so it allows you to detect these atoms one by one on microchannel plates. So what they did was to prepare a condensate and let the cloud expand and measure uh, the time of arrival on the microchannel plate here. And by measuring the time of arrival and position of the arrival, they could reconstruct the full 3D momentum distribution of their, uh, of their sample. And so this is one of the graphs they obtained. So it's n of k times k to the 4. And you see that at large k, they get some finite limits, which is a confirmation of this 1 over k to the 4 tail that you expect from a boson chain compensate from this argument here. OK. Um, so that's a uh, first relation that relates the momentum distribution and the uh, thermodynamical properties. Now there's, uh, more fundamentally, when you're looking at the large, the tail of the momentum distribution, so you, you look, you're looking at large momenta, it's equivalent with looking at properties at short distance. So you're actually looking at short distance correlations when you're looking at this tail in the momentum distribution. And uh, for instance, this is a relationship that was mentioned by Dorte uh, in our talk this morning. You can relate the momentum distribution to the uh, first order correlation function, which is defined this way. So it's the expectation value of psi dagger and psi. Uh, these two quantities, the uh, first order correlation function and the momentum distribution are just related by some, um, some uh, Fourier transform. And if you uh, look at the expansion of this Fourier transform at small r, a small distance, well, you see that the first order term is just the number of particles in your system. Just take r equal to zero, it's just the integral of psi dagger psi. It's the density, so the integral of the density is just the number of particles. But the next order term is linear in position and is proportional to the contact. So the contact op uh, operate, uh, parameter also gives you some information about the first order uh, correlation function. It gives you also some information about the second order correlation function. Actually, it gives you information about what we could call some pair distribution, the number of particles which are at a distance s from one another. So I'm going to call that the rope density of pairs times s. Uh, which is density of atomic pairs at a distance s. So uh, you should be careful. It doesn't mean that you have actual molecules. It just measures the number of particles which are at distance s, whether they are bound or not. And the law is very simple. When s is very small, this density of pairs just see the contact parameter times s times some numerical factor. So the contact also gives you the number of particles which are at a given distance from one another. So it's really information about the short-range correlations of your system. OK, and uh, I think it's the last uh, relationship that we, I'm going to show you. Uh, the contact parameter also gives you information about the dynamics of the system, and more precisely, the uh, linear response of the system. So let's imagine a situation. So I'm dealing again with uh, a uh, spin 1 half fermion. So I notes sigma equal one and sigma equal two, my two relevant spin states. So that's my many body strongly correlated uh, system. So GB measure or G measures the interactions between these two spin states. And so let's imagine that I have a third spin state, sigma equal to three, which is weakly interacting with the rest of the atoms. Essentially, it's not interacting with the rest. So there is no scattering length or scattering length is, is zero between three and two and three and one. And so I'm going to probe the system by shining some radio frequency on it. So there's a radio frequency omega, which is resonant with the transition between two and three. So the Hamiltonian that describes this kind of uh, process is very simple. It's, it has this form here. So there is some coupling constant. So omega will be some radio frequency time the integral uh, of this Hamiltonian. So you destroy one particle in state two 
you create it in step three and you have this exponential minus i omega t that tells you that you're uh, modulating at a frequency omega. And so you want to know what is the uh, transition rate from state two to state three. So, oh yes, this is expression in, uh, in momentum space. So gamma of omega is the transition rate for this, uh, for this RF radio frequency excitation. Well, you can show, and that's what I'm gonna show in a moment, that in uh, the, the large frequency tail, so when omega becomes large, this gamma omega scales like omega to the three third with a uh, proportionality constant, which is just, again, the contact parameter. So, uh, how does it work? It's just a consequence of the uh, Fermi golden rule. And also the fact that the set three is essentially non-interacting with the rest of the atoms. So first, what, this, what does it mean that the uh, state three is non-interacting? It means that the states of uh, my system, the initial state of my system, will be of the form some chi zero times the vacuum. So chi zero is a ground state of one plus two, and this is a vacuum of state three. And the final state of my excitation will be chi of n, some excited state of the system one plus two. I don't know what it is, some excited state. Tensor. The particle three with momentum k, because it's a free particle, it doesn't interact with anything else. So its eigenstates are just described by momentum states with energy h bar uh, epsilon k. And so now I just write the Fermi golden rule. So it's two pi divided by h bar times the sum of all final states of some matrix elements between the initial final state and initial state. So the matrix elements will be h bar omega times uh, the sum over k of psi dagger k, psi to dagger k, times delta of E n minus E zero plus epsilon k minus h bar omega. So I start from the initial state, I end up in the final state, and I have this Hamiltonian that operates to go from this state to that state, and I just have the energy conservation that tells me that I come from the ground state to the final state En plus epsilon k, and with the help of one photon of energy h bar omega. So I have to clean it, to clean a bit this, uh, this expression. So I know that my final state is def defined by this chi n and that's k here, this k here. So it means that I can only create a particle with momentum k, the same k which is here and there. So actually this sum here does not exist because it's already included here. So I have something which is two pi divided by h bar times h bar omega square times the sum over chi n and f of uh, chi n psi to k chi zero square delta of E n minus E zero plus epsilon k minus h bar omega. Because psi dagger three k uh, brings me from the vacuum of state three to one particle in state three with momentum k. Okay, it's and so I have a second things to do, which is to take into account the, fa the fact that I consider only large frequency excitations. So what does it mean that omega 
is very large. Okay, large compared to what? Uh, so I have essentially two terms here. I have epsilon k, the energy of the particle in state three, the final state, and En minus E zero. So En minus E zero is the difference of energy between the ground state of my many body system and the excited state that I've excited by uh, shining this array. Typically, when you extract one particle from your many body system, it costs you an energy which is a chemical potential. So this is typically the chemical potential of my system one plus two. And so what I mean by large omega, I mean omega large compared to this mu here. So I can just forget about this quantity here in this limit. And so my delta is just epsilon k minus h bar omega. So what it means that the energy of the photon is used simply to excite, to accelerate the particle in state three. So actually it should be a k here. So gamma of omega, if I forget about the prefactor, will be the sum over k of the Dirac times the, the sum over all state kn I can do that because all reference to the uh, system one plus two has been removed from the delta potential. And so I can also re-express that as chi zero psi two k dagger chi n chi n psi two k chi zero. And so I have some closure relations, so I can forget about that. And so this is just the sum over k of delta of epsilon k minus h bar omega times chi zero psi two k dagger psi two k chi zero. And this is just the number of particles in momentum state k. So it's n of k. So gamma of omega, since I know that for large k, uh, the, um, the N of K is just proportional to the contact divided by K to the four. <coughs> so it's gonna say, this is just the contact times the sum over K of delta of epsilon K minus H bar omega divided by K to the four. So the bottom line of this argument that the uh, absorption rate is proportional again to the contact. So you can calculate that very easily, and that's how you get this omega to the three-third. But what is really important here is that, once again, the prefactor is just proportional to the contact. Okay, so these relations have been tested experimentally in that, pa that paper from the group of David Jean. So they me measured both the momentum distribution and so for now uh, fermions, spin one half fermions. And so here is the plot of k to the four times n of k, and you show that there is indeed some finite limit that corresponds to the contact here. They measured the uh, absorption, the transition probability uh, when they shine some radio frequency. And so indeed, again, when they measure gamma of nu times nu three half, they have some finite uh, limit here. And so when they uh, compare the final limit that they obtain for the momentum distribution and for the RF absorption, so this is what they get. So you have the measurement of the momentum distribution in, uh, in uh, the, 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 so the solid circle. The star corresponds to the RF line shape. And so this is photo emission spectroscopy, which is another way of measuring the momentum distribution, uh, the uh, open circles. And so you see that they all, line, oh, they all lie, lie on the same line. Uh, which show you that indeed this is the same contact that appears in all these three experiments. And so they could also test the adiabatic Swift theorem, so the relationship between the contact as seen as a, uh, an information about the uh, high energy or uh, small range correlations and the thermodynamical uh, properties. 
So they plotted uh, the derivative of the energy with 1 over a versus 1 over k of a. Uh, I'll tell you uh, in the second part of my talk how this can be measured. And compared these two quantities, uh, so I think it's the one that was measured using the momentum distribution, <coughs> uh, and they both agree, showing that the, uh, the validity, experimental validity of the adiabatic Swift theorem. So it's the end of the first part of my talk. And uh, to show you that uh, the contact is actually some unifying quantity that arises from the universality hypothesis. So the fact that we assume that when we uh, make the uh, range of the potential equal to zero, even though the Dirac potential is singular, we get some finite results. And it provides some exact and model-free relations between quantities which are apparently completely different. So it gives information about the momentum distribution, the equation of state, RF spectroscopy, and also other things. Uh, Bragg spectroscopy has been tested in, uh, in Melbourne, photo association in Rice. Uh, it can be also generalized to other types of systems. So for instance, uh, for bosons, uh, we can <clears throat> there is some three-body parameter, uh, three-body contact parameter, which is associated with the derivative of the energy with the uh, three-body parameter that was discussed earlier today, and it can also be related to, uh, to three-body interactions. And you can also uh, introduce some P-wave uh, contact for P-wave interactions, uh, as it was done in Toronto, so Joseph is here, can answer questions about this. So I think that's the end for the first part of my talk, and I think it's time for the break. <laughs>